Thanks. Okay, so I'll just uh, kick start the talk. Uh, welcome everyone for the talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about Apache Hoodie and how to use it to build next generation data lakes. Um, can you go to the next slide, Siva? Uh, yeah, my name is Balaji Vadrajan. I am uh, currently a PMC member in Apache Hoodie. Uh, I'm working as a staff engineer in Robinhood. And my background lies in uh, building uh, large scale distributed systems, and I have worked in uh, LinkedIn data bus. Uh, over to you, Siva. Okay, uh, this is Siva Balan Narayanan. Uh, I'm also one of the active Apache food uh, committer. Uh, I work in Uber and mobile networking space, uh, but my interest lies in uh, distributed systems. So I worked in LinkedIn in a distributed block store, and now in my non official hours, I, I contribute to Hoodie. Um, so Let's take a look at today's agenda. So you'll start off with uh, uh, taking a look at the general requirements for a data lake. And then in the next section, we can talk about how a next generation data lake might look like and what are its requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, and then following which, we can take a look at uh, what is Apache Hoodie, what are its code principles, uh, and, and design. Uh, in the next section, we can talk about how you can actually leverage Hoodie to build an efficient data lake. Uh, we can go through some of the tools and some, uh, how to achieve some of the use cases uh, in, in the streaming analytical world. And then in the next section, we can talk about some of the upcoming features in Hoodie, and then we can end the talk with some Q&A. Uh, so before we dive into, uh, take a look at requirements of a data lake, let's see what a data lake is. Uh, so it's a centralized repository to store your data at scale, uh, irrespective of whether it's structured or unstructured. Uh, these are typically used for uh, large analytical workloads uh, built on top of Hadoop compatible cloud stores. Uh, you could typically see a different tier of tables like raw tables, derived tables, or aggregated tables, and so on for serving different needs. Um, uh, in general, these are used for generating dashboards, reports, or visualizations, or even for machine learning models. Uh, the end goal will be ma mainly for monitoring purposes, or even at some times, it's, it's, uh, it, it's critical to take some business decision based on the reports generated from these analytical workloads. So now let's uh, dive into uh, requirements to build a data lake. Uh, let's take a case of a database change capture use case. So your, your architecture might look something like this, where your inserts, updates, and deletes are maintained in an OLTP database. So from there, uh, you take a periodic snapshot and regenerate the tables in your data lake. As you could see, uh, even though updates span only a smaller percentage of the entire data set size, uh, have, you might have to take an entire snapshot every time and then regenerate your entire, entire summary table, for instance. Uh, as you could see, you can't do a bulk load every time uh, because this leads to unnecessary read and write amplification. And you also end up wasting a lot of compute resources along the way. Uh, this also means that uh, it results in unavailability of fresh data in your downstream tables because you can't run a periodic snapshot every few minutes. The next one is an incremental pool, which goes hand in hand with an incremental ingestion. Um, so here you could uh, see a typical organization of different tables in a data lake. Uh, so from different real-time data sources, uh, uh, typically you ing ingest something into something called raw tables in your data lake. Uh, from raw tables, uh, you generate some derived tables. Uh, you do some filtering, cleansing, or pruning, and then you generate derived tables. Uh, from derived tables, you 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 could actually uh, have some aggregated tables like summary tables, which is actually fed into your your dashboards, reports, or uh, any of these visualizations. Uh, as you could see, uh, let's say if you want to keep uh, if you want to keep data fresh for the aggregated table C, uh, you can't actually uh, read the entire derived table from time and again and then uh, repopulate the entire summary table or aggregated table. So your data lake should support incremental pull, uh, which means that it just takes uh, uh, the updates from the last checkpoint at time and then apply it to your aggregated uh, aggregated table. Uh, Dedoping log events uh, is pretty much uh, a necessity when, when you're dealing with uh, uh, Kafka kind of pipelines. Uh, let's take a, a scenario of uh, uh, aggregating some stats on impression events. So from Kafka, you ingest into your data lake. As you could see, this is a high-scale time series data. 
to the order of millions or even billions per day. Uh, there are chances of duplicates in this pipeline uh, due to various reasons. Uh, for example, the clients could retry due to various networking errors, uh, or the data pipeline which you're using to push to Kafka uh, could gap the at least one semantics. Uh, so there are there are a lot of problems with dupli duplications. It could result in low fidelity data. So the reports which you generate are not very much reliable. Uh, so for example, more impressions could result in more dollars, which means you end up paying customers more or end up charging customers more. Uh, if you have worked with uh, large analytical workloads, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've come across a lot of small file problems. It's very notorious. Uh, so having a lot of small files in your data set uh, results in a lot of metadata overhead in both managing and even it results in uh, uh, increasing your latency for read queries. On the other end of the spectrum, you could actually stitch files in the ingestion path and then so that you, you can uh, avoid a lot of creation of a lot of small files. But again, this has its own cons. It results in a lo lot of delays in your ingestion pipeline, and it results in a lot of unnecessary fi uh, file IOs as well. So for example, it takes typically uh, five to 10 minutes to read like a 2 GB parquet file. Uh, so you could take a hybrid approach of doing a file switching. Um, but then so there is no real standardization on, on file switching. Uh, but again, uh, while doing file switching, you need to ensure consistency guarantees. And you also need to ensure snapshot isolation because your small files could have been exposed to your query engine. So uh, you need to ensure snapshot isolation is guaranteed. Uh, next requirement is around transactional rights. Uh, th this is nothing but asset guarantees. So I'll just skim through fastly. Uh, first one is atomicity. That could be uh, a failure halfway, halfway through your ingestion. And due, in, in case of bad data, you might wish to roll back. Uh, so at any point in time, either your entire batch of write is actually published or nothing is published. Uh, your data lake should also support, uh, ensure consistency guarantees. So no partial data should be exposed to the end user. Uh, since your data lake should support concurrent writer, writers and readers, uh, snapshot isolation should be guaranteed. And it should ensure strong durability, uh, which means that there, there's, there shouldn't be no data loss, which means that if you made a commit, and then if your storage node crashes for some reason, your data lake should ensure there's no data loss. Uh, so off late, there have been a lot of regulations around data deletions and privacy. You might have come across GDPR or even CCPA, California Consumer Privacy Act. Uh, so uh, there's a strong need for uh, deleting records uh, from, from your data lake. Um, so this essentially means that your, your data lake should support efficient delete operations, uh, which means that there should be like a, a pointish lookups on your on your right path, uh, like a needle in a haystack. And, and But still, your data lake should be uh, optimized for scans, because most of the analytical workloads are write ones and read, uh, read heavy use cases. Uh, and it should also support propagating these changes or deletions to the downstream tables as well. So there are a few other requirements uh, which data lake should support in general, like it should support handling of later reading data. Uh, the data format should be open in the sense like you don't lock in the user. And it should enforce uh, schematization of data. Uh, point in time queries, if you want to take a look at how your data looked like, like two days back, it should support point in time queries. And save points for safer recovery and so on. Um, so data lake has been around for a few years now. So the requirements for data lake has been evolving. And uh, uh, in this section, we can dive into uh, to take a look at how the next generation data lake uh, requirements might look like. Uh, your data lake should, should be dynamic in nature. Uh, let, let me walk through an illustration to, to uh, explain what do I mean by dynamic. So going back to the impression event example, so from Kafka, you generate a, a aggregated stats table in your data lake. Um, so your schema might look something like this. Where you have event ID, event time, user ID, date string, and so on. So um, sometimes that could be a mismatch between your query and ingestion pattern. So for example, in this case, your ingestion could be based on arrival time, uh, but then your queries could be based on event time. Uh, so this means that based on arrival time, you have layered or you have laid out your data in such a manner depending on arrival time, whereas your queries are actually following a different pattern, which is event time. Um, so uh, the data lake requires primitives around reorganizing data after 
ingestion has happened because your queries are, are changing, the patterns of queries are changing. Uh, so uh, while supporting such reorganizing or reclustering of data, uh, these or, uh, reorganization should be pluggable and it should be non-blocking. Non-blocking is very important because you can't actually, uh, in, the, in this pipeline, you can't uh, increase uh, the latency in the right path or you can't actually stop the machinery, do a rewrite of the entire data set, and then open up for queries. So it should be non-blocking as well. Good. Yeah, so here you could see a, a, a simple uh, streaming analytical uh, architecture. So on the right, you could see a, a batch ingestion maintained in a data lake, uh, where it's refreshed, let's say, every few hours. Uh, on the left, you could see a stream processing pipeline uh, where the freshness guarantees uh, it's expected to be near real time to the order of one to five minutes. Um, so uh, typically, the data lakes are often overlooked uh, to be meant only for batch processing uh, because of the lack of primitives and support for stream processing. Uh, but data lake should should uh, go to the next next generation, so it should actually support stream processing because there's a lot of overhead in maintaining different uh, specialized systems for stream processing and for your batch processing, processing needs. So your data lake should, should evolve to support stream processing pipelines as well. One of the most critical uh, requirements nowadays is your, your ingestion should be auto-managed. Um, as you might have noticed, the sources of raw data is of heterogeneous nature. Uh, it ranges from DB change logs to Kafka event streams or uh, listening to S3 buckets and so on. So typically, these are implemented at separate custom ingestion pipelines and maintained by users. Uh, so again, there's a lot of overhead in maintaining these separate custom pipelines. So your data data lake should support automating most of these operations, uh, if not all. Uh, to be explicit, I mean that uh, data lake should support incremental read and checkpointing. Uh, it should support merge and uh, uh, deletes. Basically, you, you take a bunch of updates and just apply to your data lake. Uh, it should support rollback uh, whenever it's required, and then it should support compaction. Um, uh, inline, if not, it should support asynchronous compaction, which is self-managed by its own and it's continuous uh, in nature. So typically, data lake expose, the, the read path of the data lake is, is exposed via different query engines. Uh, query optimization is done to different measures. One is partition pruning and another one is column level or group level pruning. Uh, so again, if, you, if your pattern of query changes, uh, let's say if, if, so, if the columns are filtered based on a non-partition column, you end up reading most of your partitions, so your uh, read performance might take a hit. So data lakes can do much better with uh, uh, having some auxiliary structures. For example, uh, data lake should so, could store some uh, secondary indices or bloom index. Secondary indices, I mean, uh, like a sparse index, like a range index, uh, which you could maintain for commonly qu uh, queried or filtered columns. Uh, and then Bloom index you could maintain for every data file, so uh, at, at frequently uh, queried columns. So again, uh, this uh, the basic uh, objective here is that you reduce the number of data files to be looked up to serve your read query. So these all will actually uh, key, uh, ensure you keep your read latency under control. So I, it's over to Balaji for the rest of the section. Okay, let me share my screen. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Cool. Okay. So I'll just uh, talk about uh, Apache Huri uh, in general and how it can be used to implement the next generation data lake. Uh, we'll start with the uh, overview of Huri. Uh, Huri uh, manages the storage of uh, large analytical data sets. Uh, there are many facets to Huri. Uh, as a storage abstraction, uh, it provides efficient uh, absurd and uh, incremental primitives. Uh, Huri's ingestion framework called Delta Streamer, Spark data source, and structured streaming integration uh, are like uh, building blocks for building a unified streaming and uh, batch processing pipelines. Uh, from the implementation perspective, it can, you can think of it as a library, uh, which can uh, scale with the processing engine like Spark for writes and for query engines for read. Uh, and it basically supports 
uh, storing the analytical data sets in any Hadoop compatible uh, stores. Uh, on the right side, Hudi provides three levels of APIs. Um, at the first one is a low level right client API, which operates at, uh, uh, at RDD abstraction um, and provides low level absurd insert APIs. Uh, there's also the Spark data source and uh, streaming uh, integration, uh, which you can use to uh, build uh, batch or streaming uh, ingestion pipelines. Uh, Hudi also comes with its own ingestion framework called Delta Streamer, uh, which integrates with various different uh, upstream sources uh, and provides uh, uh, ingestion framework for ingesting to uh, Hudi tables. On the read side, Hudi provides uh, three distinct views. Uh, on, there's one uh, view called read optimized view, which provides uh, the latest snapshot of the data set for different query engines. And it provides columnar performance. Uh, it basically stores the data in parquet format and uh, provides columnar performance. The other one is the real-time view, uh, which we will look into further in the next subsequent slides. But it again actually provides a snapshot views. Uh, it pro it, it uh, takes a, a slight read cost in performing uh, on the fly merge for but for providing the latest uh, committed data. Um, and there is this novel uh, incremental view uh, which we support in Hoodie. Uh, it provides basically a change log view for uh, any uh, incremental processing that uh, that's needed for building uh, ETL uh, pipelines. When it comes to uh, the storage layout, Hoodie has uh, two different types. Uh, uh, one is uh, called copy on write. Uh, here, uh, records are always written in uh, columnar format. Uh, that basically means that any changes uh, to existing records, any updates or deletes, will uh, result in a new version of the columnar file uh, getting added. Uh, there is also this another uh, storage type called merge on read. Uh, it's primarily used to speed up the ingestion. Uh, here, um, basically, it supports. I mean, it, the format is both columnar and uh, row-based delta files. Uh, we uh, yeah, updates are basically uh, instead of creating a new version of parquet files, we actually append them into a row format, and there is a background uh, compaction job that merges these delta files to create a new version of the columnar files. Uh, we will look at um, the. An illustration of how a copy on write table and uh, how a merge on read table manages the layout and provides uh, a consistent view to the data set. We'll start with the copy on write uh, storage layout. Uh, let's assume that's a Hoodie managed data set, and Hoodie uh, uses something called a commit timeline. Uh, it's basically a folder inside a data set. Uh, Hoodie uses that to to basically record all the operations that are happening on the data set and also uh, along with the state at which these operations are present. Uh, let's imagine for this illustration there are four keys, uh, records with four keys, key one to key four, uh, which needs to be ingested to this data set. Uh, Hoodie begins with uh, creating a marker file called in-flight file in the commit timeline, uh, announcing the intent to uh, ingest this new data. Uh, it then goes ahead and creates these uh, files, the column of uh, parquet files. Uh, so in this example, assume that like key one and key three are co-located in file one, uh, whereas uh, key uh, two and key four are located in uh, file two. So once this is uh, written, uh, if you look at the commit timeline, uh, Hoodie will mark the, the the action as completed. So Subsequently, any op read operations that are performed on these data set will see the files that have been written um, as part of the commit C1. So far, so good. So uh, like once this is done, like let's assume that in future there's an update that's going to happen on key one and key three. Uh, Hoodie again like, uh, like creates an in-flight uh, marker file in the timeline to announce the new in, uh, ingestion that's going to happen for the batch two. Uh, it uh, in this case, Hoodie is going to do an index lookup, and it figures out that key one and key three are located in file one. So it basically creates a, a new version of the parquet file uh, with the updated records, key one and key three in it. So once this is done, um, the 
timeline is marked uh, for the commit C2 is marked done. And uh, like after this point in time, any uh, read queries that are happening on this data set is going to see the latest version of the file one, uh, which is at C2, um, and it's going to read the data. Uh, this is how uh, copy on write manages the, uh, the data set. Now with merge on read, um, the first batch is almost the same, where um, we can again like, assume that there are four keys here. Um, we uh, write these four keys are ingested to two different parquet files, uh, and um, the commit is done. Uh, at this point, let's say uh, a new batch comes in, uh, and just this is where it actually differs from the previous copy on write storage layout. So um, Houdi again is going to perform an index lookup. It's going to figure out that key one and key three belongs to file uh, one, whereas key two belongs to file two. And But here, instead of creating a new version of a parquet file, uh, it is going to append these uh, records without merging the changes to the previous uh, record. Uh, and it's going to append them to uh, a delta file in, in row format in Avro. And uh, this is going to be uh, fast, wherein like uh, it doesn't have to like take the hit of creating a columnar file and performing uh, updates, um, mergers if in, if it needed. Uh, and so uh, this is how like uh, merge on read basically get, uh, gets uh, basically uh, uh, gets a quicker ingestion uh, as opposed to a copy on write table. So uh, important uh, view here is this real time view. Uh, here, what happens is that um, if you want the latest snapshot uh, that includes both the changes that have been committed in C1, which is in, in columnar format, and C2, which is in uh, uh, the unmerged row format, uh, we use this view called real-time view. This performs on-the-fly merge of both the columnar uh, parquet file and the unmerged uh, record records and provide a latest a snapshot view for the uh, user. So this way, uh, any queries that uses this view will be able to see the changes that have happened in both C1 and C2. Uh, but the, it actually is going to take a small hit on of uh, on the read side of taking the of merging these two changes on the read side. Uh, but if you don't want to take the hit, uh, there's a trade-off here wherein like uh, there's a view called read optimized view which will only read C1's committed data, which is already there in uh, merged format in columnar uh, format. And it's going to just like get columnar performance for it. But it's not going to see the changes that happened after C1, uh, in this case, C2. Um, so th these are two different views. And uh, uh, there is a background compaction job, uh, which will happen eventually, which will compact uh, these unmerged records and the and the changes that are there in C1 and to create a new file version. So that way, uh, the read optimized view will be able to see both C1 and C2 changes. So now that we uh, saw like the like basics of uh, Hoodie uh, in terms of how it uh, manages the, uh, the records and how does it manage the storage layout and uh, what views it provides, uh, we will look at uh, some of the functionalities that it provides in order to build and efficient data lake. So we'll start with uh, Delta Streamer. Basically, uh, uh, okay. So ingestion uh, is uh, not just about the data format that gets returned or the the processing engine that's getting used, right? So it's uh, basically a framework uh, a platform, I would say, which needs to deal with uh, a lot of other things. Uh, you need to uh, keep track of uh, where you are in your consumption of upstream source when using data. Uh, there is going to be uh, various types of upstream sources and you need to support all of them when ingesting the data to your data lake. Uh, we need to handle partial failures during ingestion, which is just a norm. Uh, you need to perform rollbacks. You need to clean up old versions of these files that are getting added and uh, any uh, compactions that needs to be done for merge on read because all needs to be done in an automa uh, uh, automatic fashion so that you don't have to deal with um, them separately. And it's also um, a norm that you don't, sometimes you don't actually like 
ingest all the raw data in its in its primitive form but you would have to apply some filtering or transformations for example you might need to remove some paa columns uh, all these needs to be happen on the source data before you write to hudi table so you need some uh, framework where you can apply these kind of transformations and uh, uh, more often than not there are going to be multiple tables uh, in your data pipeline uh, in your data lake basically and one of them uh, and you need to make sure that you're able to ingest and have an etl framework that can that can provide uh, like basically a new data to uh, each of these tables so hudi comes with a, a delta streamer uh, it's an ingestion framework which takes care of all these above functionalities uh, it supports uh, popular upst upstream sources like kafka dfs log files and even upstream hudi tables if you want to build a chained pipeline in your data lake uh, it supports continuous streaming and uh, mode for like a streaming kind of an ingestion or in uh, or in batch mode like run once if you want to do a batch ingestion job uh, so we can um, like we'll look into some streaming ingestion a little more uh, in depth and uh, uh, there are basically some use cases uh, like uh, building near real time dashboards uh, use cases like fraud or risk where you want to do some business anomaly detection which requires uh, like a near real time data freshness um, near real time here refers to i mean uh, latency of around uh, 5 minutes uh, early would be too long uh, for such cases and uh, traditionally like specialized databases have been the go to systems for such use cases uh, so even though there are there is a powerful ecosystem on the data lake side uh, with uh, query engines sql support notebooks and other things even with such a support like data lake has often been overlooked um, so hudi's um, merge on read design with uh, the structured streaming support uh, delta streamer and the incremental processing capabilities that hudi provides uh kind of helps uh, achieve these uh, low sla you needed for uh, these business use cases and that by you can you can think of using the the data lake as a provider for uh, solving these kind of business use cases i don't need to go to specialized databases um for for doing such such as some of these uh, for supporting some of these use cases basically uh so now that we looked at uh the features provided by hudi for managing your pipeline uh, let's look at what it takes to migrate an existing uh, parquet uh, data set to hudi uh, there are a few ways to uh, bootstrap but first let's look at uh, the record structure maintained by hudi uh, hudi maintains a row level metadata to support efficient upsearch and incremental views uh, we need to generate these metadata uh, so in this case if you look at it uh, there is this commit time there are other few other fields that that are part of uh, what we call as row um, metadata that hudi maintains uh, we need to have these metadata for hudi to provide upsert and incremental permits uh, one way to uh, to build a parquet uh, so a hudi data set is to basically read the data set in parquet in whole or in parts and write them to new location in hudi format this will be like a one time cost that you will do but you can also um, like if you if you think that you are you are this one time cost is like prohibitive uh, you can also do it in an incremental fashion where uh, there are like new partitions that are getting added which you can write it in hudi format but keep the older partitions intact in in uh, read only mode and untouched so hudi will be able to seamlessly handle uh, this case when you want to read from such a data set so in this case you have an example where the data set is uh, date partition and some of the old days is in non hudi partitions and one point in time you want to let's say uh, move to hudi so you don't have to do bootstrap you can start writing to new partitions with uh, with hudi primitives and um, yeah so this essentially basically there's a trade off if you can see here uh, one is uh, like you take a one time bootstrap cost um, um but and then you get like all the benefits that you get from hudi but the other one is like you you don't want to take the cost and you want to do a, a partial um, bootstrapping in this case a partial migration in this case uh, but you will miss out of uh, absurd features uh, in in the old partitions but i mean we did just 
new partition co co mechanism. Uh, a quick reminder: we are thirty minutes into the presentation. Sure, sure. So we have a we have introduced a new uh, bootstrapping mechanism which uh, doesn't require uh, complete rewrites, uh, but at the same time provides OD subsert support. Uh, the idea is to break uh, a hoodie file to two files. Uh, one is called a hoodie skeleton file, which contains all the uh, metadata files, and uh, there's this other file which is the actual existing uh, parquet file. And um, Hudi uh, maintains an auxiliary structures uh, to link these two files. So that way, when you want to bootstrap, you don't have to rewrite the whole data set, but just create this uh, metadata skeleton file for each of these uh, data files. Uh, this way, it's, the bootstrapping is very fast, and you don't need to, uh, uh, and Hudi internally manages uh, like providing upsert and incremental parameters on such a data set. So this way, bootstrap is faster, and you also get the upsert functionalities. So quickly, I'm moving quickly onto the uh, upcoming features. Again, like this is with respect to how it's going to help the building an efficient data lake. Um, so we'll start with like uh, quickly, like so as we mentioned in the previous slides, uh, Hudi has uh, like maintains a lot of uh, metadata. Like one is at row level uh, fields, and it also maintains uh, bloom filters, range statistics, and all the timeline um, related uh, metadata that it keeps. Uh, but it primarily uses this information to speed up uh, record key lookups for upsets, uh, reduce file listings, and uh, supporting uh, incremental uh, parameters. But we can actually do uh, better with this metadata. So we can organize file listing metadata uh, so that we can uh, totally avoid uh, uh, file listings, which could be slow. We can also extend uh, the range statistics that we have already and uh, reorganize them so that uh, we can basically maintain column indexes for any, any columns to speed up query planning and uh, faster lookups. Uh, this can also be done in, in a sparse way or in, or in a dense way uh, as well. Uh, but if you see, some of these metadata could be significantly large and scales in footprint with data. Um, also, uh, metadata and data need to be consistent with each other. Um, so what that basically means, like any partial failures that happens in data uh, needs to be handled in the other metadata as well. So they need to be uh, operated in an atomic fashion. So the question is, uh, how do we uh, uh, design storage for such metadata, which would scale and also provide uh, such guarantees? Okay, a simple and elegant solution is to treat metadata in the same way as we treat uh, data. Uh, basically, make it an internal table and change commit protocol such that both data and metadata table is consistent. So if you look at this example here, uh, let's assume this is a uh, base path for a data set, and a conceptual OD table would look like something like this. It has um, many data partitions, which where it contains all the data files. It also has a, uh, a hoodie folder where it keeps the timeline of all the operations that happened. And in and uh, here we are going to maintain. We're creating an internal table called metadata table, um, which again would support absurd and all other operations that Hoodie provides. But uh, this is for updating the metadata itself. So um, in the case of file listing here, the metadata files is going to uh, point to, uh, which we're going to have the file paths, which is going to point to the data files. And uh, you can simply see that like how this model can actually extend to any of the metadata for columnar index or any other index where you can, um, you can you can employ the same strategy to to to, ma to maintain those metadata files. So in summary, actually, like this this uh, model uh, uh, provides uh, it's kind of very elegant, and you get all the hoodie machinery benefits for for free here. You don't have to reinvent the wheel and uh, do something different for managing metadata as opposed to data, uh, like rollbacks and any partial failures are handled in an atomic fashion and uh, uh, the the different types are also extendable, like meaning like you um, it's extendable to many different metadata formats as well. So quickly moving to um, um, I think the final part of it, which is like uh, reclustering data. Um, so reorganizing this data to optimize for query is often necessary to speed up uh, common case or business critical queries. In just pattern and uh, query patterns often differs. Uh, you would want to reorganize such that 
you can merge uh, many small files to a large file. Uh, and uh, this can be done in a, an, as part of write operation, but it's going to basically uh, slow down your writes, your ingestion latency, uh, and uh, you don't want that. So you want to design a model where you can basically do this as a background operation in an asynchronous fashion uh, without, without uh, blocking the uh, writes. So Hudi already uh, supports uh, asynchronous machine learning, which is used to, uh, this, is how, this is how compaction is basically performed right now. Um, so it basically uh, does this in a non-blocking fashion without blocking the writes, and there's no need for any central coordination. And we, use, we are going to use the same machinery for extend and extend this model to support uh, reorganizing the data. Uh, so finally, like uh, last part before I end up the meeting. So, uh, so these are the features that we are, uh, uh, I mean, it's av either available or in the works. Uh, the first one is like we recently uh, landed uh, the Hive style insert overwrite mode for overwriting uh, either a hoodie complete table or a partition. Uh, Spark 3.0 and Flink uh, support is underway. And there's also work happening to support uh, virtual record keys in Hoodie. Uh, so yeah, so these are interesting times uh, in Hoodie. And if you want to contribute to Hoodie, please let us know. We'll be happy to help you on board. Thank you. Uh, any questions? OK, so. Okay. Yeah, I will share the we will share this presentation uh, uh, after this meeting. Uh, or let me, uh, Siva, can you actually share the link and say, keep put it here as well if you can? Okay. Sure, I will. I will upload it to the the Google Drive link or something which we got in the email. Okay, so okay. yeah, so I think uh, so. The other question is about uh, uh, Apache Hoodie and Apache Iceberg. Um, so um, I mean, there are definitely some common functionalities uh, there in terms of how the know in what what in terms of what it uh, what we try to achieve um, but uh, i mean from hoodie's perspective we, we wanted it's just not like uh, the metadata format as itself right so basically it's like we are planning to have a, a, like a, a complete framework where we can uh, manage your entire data lake where you can perform streaming ingestion provide this kind of uh, reorganizing the data in a way where um, which you can speed up the query. So, um, so some of the parts, like in terms of uh, where I, Apache Iceberg, if I you know, think at least, like they're trying to replace the Hive Meta store. Um, so there are like some commonalities in it, but they're like like fundamentally we see it as a different uh, uh, different uh, pieces of uh, uh, the data lake puzzle. Is that, is that how I would put it? Um, so uh, Delta Lake is again like another. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think there's like uh, they also support absurds uh, uh, and um, uh, ingest the data. Uh, so again, but I would I would like put it in a way like we are uh, we have our own uh, way of uh, uh, like view of uh, uh, like project where we wanted to support these like many different uh, like as a platform what we wanted to add. Uh, so that I think there's like a big divergence there in terms of uh, the functionalities that we want to support, and we don't want to just stick with Spark. We want to support other processing engines like Spark, Flink, and other things. So um, that is uh, that's like traditionally like there's that, that's a dichotomy there basically. And uh, okay, if I can also add one one feature that's like kind of unique to Hoodie is like incremental processing basically. Um, so um, uh, just like kind of novel to uh, Hoodie and none of the other systems actually provide. Like if you think of it as like it's a powerful primitive where you can, if you uh, want to build ETL chains, right? Your your data lake is not going to be just like one one single data table, right? It's going to be a, uh, like a, a collection of tables where with, with some kind of a DAG dependencies between them. Um, so uh, like every time you want to either like re rewrite the whole table or rewrite the whole partition, uh, based on your upstream data changes, you uh, that's like not that needs to be an efficient uh, primitive to support that, and Hoodie provides that in the sense that like it can provides a change log stream where uh, you can basically uh, just read the changes that happened in the upstream table uh, and uh, just apply or process those changes and uh, 
keep your downstream table up to date uh, without having to uh, read uh, like a large footprint of your upstream table and rewriting the whole table. That's like much more uh, uh, inefficient in our opinion. Okay, uh, so any other questions? Okay. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. So let, let me put the link actually. So it's, it's shareable, I believe. So uh, let me share and uh, okay. I'll copy the link. I hope this is readable. Um, but we will share it in the in the Apache uh, uh, con as well, so that like it will be available when the video is available. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys.